Welcome to Mars de Gras, everybody. My name is Michelle, and we're coming to you live from the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. We are so happy to have you with us. This is our Mars rover landing watch party, and for the next two hours, we are going to be highlighting the red planet Mars. In uh, just under two hours, NASA is going to attempt to land a car-sized rover on the red planet. Now, you are welcome to just watch us in this program. That would be great. But if you want to interact with our team and with each other, please join us in the YouTube chat. We know several of you have been doing that already. All you need to do is type a message into the chat and send it our way. Uh, if you see a name with a blue wrench next to it in the chat, that is one of our astronomers, Dr. Geza Juke. He is there to answer a few of your questions. If you see the other planetarium name highlighted in yellow, in the chat, we have a couple YouTube moderators out there. We have Kelly and Robert. So if you want to say hi to Kelly and Robert and Geza, please do that as well. If you are encountering the Adler Planetarium for the very first time on YouTube and you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do just hit that subscribe button. And if you like us, we would appreciate it if you gave us a thumbs up as well. And we would like to take a special chance to say thank you to our sponsors for this show, Bank of America and CNA. And thank you especially to all of our followers and fans who have supported us throughout the past year while we have been closed to the public. Your support allows us to bring the Adler Planetarium's out of this world content to a worldwide online audience. We sincerely appreciate it. So let's get started. Uh, please type in the YouTube. We know you've been doing that already. Type in the YouTube. Where are you writing to us from? Where are you watching? And uh, what's your favorite fact about Mars? We'll get to a couple of those in just a second. And so we also have other YouTube programs. Just wanted to mention after this one's over, if you want to check out Sky Observer's Hangout or Skywatch Weekly or our Google Arts and Culture exhibits, please do that. We would love for you to investigate all the online content that we have for you. So my name is Michelle Nichols, and I'm the director of public observing at the Adler Planetarium. And I have been a space nerd for most of my life. And I have a fellow space nerd sitting next to me here, Dr. Andrew Johnston. Andrew, would you like to say hello to everybody? Yeah, very true. A, a fellow uh, space nerd, like a lot of you out there as well. We're really happy to be joining you here from the Adler Planetarium from the frozen shores of Lake Michigan. As you can see, we're all suited up appropriately and for their socially distanced and masked uh, uh, way of sharing this kind of content with a representation of the spacecraft that is landing on Mars in just under uh, two hours or so. Really happy to be connecting with you today and sharing what's going on on Mars today. Exactly. We have a third member of the team. That is Mike Smale. He is our director of theaters. Uh, and there he is. He wanted to say hi to you guys. He's going to be <laughs> behind the scenes controlling all of the tech and making sure that we look really great on TV. All right, now let's take a quick look at the chat and see who's joining us. All right, we have Horizon Science Academy in Southwest Chicago. Hi, guys. We have Martina from Italy. Um, we have uh, someone tuning in from Libertyville, and that person's favorite fact about Mars is that its eccentric orbit helped Johannes Kepler realize that the planet orbits are elliptical. Very, Very cool. True. Yes, yes, it is. And uh, we have Brandon Strawn. It's a he's a Chicago Public School fifth. Oh, Brandon from Strawn, uh, Chicago Public Schools fifth graders. Hello, Brandon Strawn and the Chicago Public Schools fifth graders. Um, Bonnie from Ontario. That Mars is easily spotted in the sky. Yes, that is a cool thing to be able to actually see the red planet in the sky. And then we have Walter, a former former NASA Glenn employee. So Glenn research center in Ohio, checking in from Roscoe Village, and Glenn is really excited about all this. I also wanted to give out a special shout out to the Glen Ellen Public Library, the Schomburg Township District, District Library, the Addison Public Library, the Elmhurst Public Library, and all the libraries out there in the Chicagoland area and around the country, and even around the world, who are uh, watching and uh, joining us today and crossing our fingers collectively that mm -hmm. this rover will land safely on Mars. All right, thank you so much, everyone. We're so glad you're with us. So sit back, relax, type away in the chat, send us your questions, and periodically throughout this program, we'll answer a few. Mm -hmm. All right, now there's something very special happening in just a little while. NASA is going to attempt to land a robot on Mars. And so we've got a picture of that coming up. There it is. There and it is. so this robot's name is Perseverance. And it is a car-sized wheeled rover that will land in a special place called Jezero Crater. Andrew, 
what is the what's the goal of this mission here? Yeah, so the the image is great there because it shows the the rover moving around and using its uh, experiment arm, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, to better understand what happened with those rocks in the past. What we want to do is better understand how that part of Mars developed through time and how it, the climate may have changed because we know that Mars had a different climate than it was today. Right now, Mars is is cold, and dry. In the past, there's really good evidence that it was more like the Earth. This rover is equipped with the kinds of instruments that's going to be able to help us tell that story by looking in very fine detail at those rocks to see what Mars was like long ago. So it helps us understand how planets in general change through time, Mars, Earth, and others. Yep. And so this rover is uh, basically a wheeled robot geologist, and it's uh, going to study those rocks on Mars. We're going to talk an awful lot more about that um, in just a little bit. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into landing a robot on another planet, especially one that is as big as this rover is. It weighs more than 2,000 pounds, and it is the size of a compact car. Now, the image that's behind us, this is bigger <laughs> than the real rover. Um, you'll see that in just a sec. We're going to walk over to it in just a little bit and uh, point out some things that are that are on that rover. But NASA has created a great computer animation just to give us a flavor of how this rover, the size of a car, is going to land on Mars. So let's take a look at that animation. There's there's a date right now uh, that where we are, and you can see the spacecraft is approaching Mars. You just saw part of it separated that had the solar panels. It's how it powered in flight as it was going to Mars. It has a heat shield that protects it from the heat of re-entry. Mars does have an atmosphere. And then the parachute deploys, which slows it down. But the atmosphere of Mars isn't thin, is not thick enough for that parachute to slow it down completely. So what happens next? The rover drops out, and then rockets fire to slow it down so that it gets to a nice gentle descent speed. And then as it gets close to the surface, something amazing happens. The car-sized rover itself separates and suspended on cables. And then the part that we call the sky crane with the rockets detaches and flies away to a safe distance where it smashes onto the surface, thus leaving the rover on the surface ready to do its science. It's an amazing solution for how do you get the thing a size of a, a small car to the surface of another world. And the engineers for this mission and one previous mission came up with this idea of the sky crane so that it has the rocket motors that slows it down and then releases it onto the surface. So I'm sure Mrs. Perez's third graders are all wondering, wait a minute, who came up with this? This is, that's a, that's a crazy looking system, right? But it's engineers. It's physics. It, it, it works. Yeah, the, the, it really is a good solution to that problem that you want to minimize the mass that you have to move to another planet. You know, in order to get to Mars, you need a big rocket. Well, the, the bigger your spacecraft is, the bigger rocket you need, the more fuel, the more power, and it becomes more complicated uh, and more expensive. So they came up with this idea of a relatively small shell surrounding it with those, with those rocket motors on it, and then it releases it, it suspends it uh, on those cables, so it minimizes the amount of sort of surrounding mass, so to speak, so that your spacecraft is, is more rover than, than spacecraft. So that's why they're able to fly this uh, in, in a, as least complicated a way as possible, although it's still pretty complex. It is pretty complex. So um, I need to say hello to a couple more people, and then we're going to walk over to the rover here. We're going to say hello to Alexandra Gonzalez from the Little Village neighborhood in Chicago and Chicago's southwest side. And, oh my goodness, I'm, I hope I do not mispronounce the name of this elementary school. Forgive me if I do. Topochkali Elementary School, sixth grade class. Thank you so much for joining us. It makes us so happy to know there are, there are students and teachers joining us. So do you guys want to go over to explore the rover some more? Let's go. Yeah, let, let's go ahead and take a close look. All right. So we're going to get our globe out of the way there. And we're walking over. We've got our pointers because what you probably can't realize is how big this thing is. Well, they can see now. Yeah, yeah they can see now. We, but... want, we want to thank our colleagues at uh, NASA JPL that provided us with, with the data and enable us to, to share this amazing image with you. Exactly. Now, again, this is bigger than the real rover. So we're looking essentially from the ground up. And so that's just going to make something a lot taller than it should be. So this, this rover in this picture is about 10 feet tall. But the real rover is seven feet tall. That's but, still pretty about amazing. About there, about there. Yeah, yeah about, about here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a tall rover.
but that's important. And, and you had a, a comment about where the cameras are positioned and, and what that has to do with people. Yeah, that's a good place to start with our tour around the Perseverance rover. So you see that this thing in the center is the mast. So this is a tall, they call it the mast, and it contains instruments up there. The main uh, cameras for looking around the, uh, the, uh, the, around the surroundings of Mars are right here and here. These are stereoscopic cameras at the top of this mast, and then there are other cameras for looking at different wavelengths of light that enable scientists to understand what rocks are made of. But the interesting thing about this, uh, this rover is that the cameras that you see there are roughly the height of a human. If we, if we had an actual geologist standing there on Mars, the eyes, so to speak, would be at about that, that, that right height, which gives you a good uh, vantage point for seeing the surrounding area. So there are uh, some more cameras all over this rover. For the very first time, all the cameras are in color. Uh, previously, some cameras were in color on other rovers, and some were grayscale, black and white. But this one is all color, so we're going to be able to see uh, completely around this rover in what it looks like, kind of if we were standing there taking a look with our eyes. But there's a really interesting camera way up here. This is called SuperCam, and SuperCam <laughs> is, uh, is pretty super. It's, it's pretty neat because it's not only, uh, it's tied, it's an image sensor, but then it's also a laser. So this laser can shoot out, and what it does is it can vaporize a little tiny sample of rock. And it releases a little plume of gas, and so a sensor detects what gases are contained in that little plume, so you can figure out what the rock is made of. It's kind of a way of, of, of remotely understanding what the rock is made of from many feet away by, by blasting it with a laser. Yep, and you can do it from up to 20 feet away. So that means if you find something interesting, you don't necessarily have to go over to it, but maybe you find something interesting about that rock and you want to then drive over to it. So it's a way to study a lot of different things without maybe having to go up to them. And maybe there might be a rock that might be a little too dangerous That's to go right. up yeah. to. That's so, right, so, so yeah. Sometimes the scientists want to drive the rover into the precarious little cliffs, but then the engineers on the on the mission team will say, no, you can't go there because your rover will, will, <laughs> will turn over. Before we leave the mast, might as well call out the stuff in the middle here, in the middle of the mast, there are meteorological sensors for understanding the temperature, uh, the radiation environment, the wind speed, uh, because as we said before, Mars does have that atmosphere. It's an essential part of understanding the climate. Uh, so th there are the sensors there for understanding, getting a weather report on Mars. Yep, it also includes a dust sensor to be able to see how dusty the Martian atmosphere is. That pink sky that you see in pictures on Mars is primarily due to there's, there's a pretty good amount of dust that is occasionally up into, into that atmosphere. So how about some more stuff? Now, one thing that we can't show you because in this image, it's on the, the other side of the rover, um, but there are microphones on this rover. So it will be able to take uh, microphone sounds of landing and then also during the operation of the rover. So that'll be pretty exciting. And yeah. that has a connection to SuperCam as well. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, right. That's, that's right, exactly. You'll be able to understand that environment. You'll be able to hear that instrument, the SuperCam uh, 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 operating, because when it shoots that laser, and I said it blasts it and vaporizes it, it should make a little popping noise. We'll actually be able to get to hear it. That'll, yeah. that'll be exciting. And the popping noise is slightly different depending on what kind of rock you might be blasting the laser into. So that is pretty super cool. So, the, so that instrument is, is, is useful for looking at rocks from far away. But we do have other instruments on, on the rover for useful if we get right up to it. And they're mostly on the main arm, which is over on your end, Michelle. So mm -hmm. why don't you mention a couple things at I the end sure of the arm? I will. There. Okay, so the, in this image, the robotic arm is shown folded up. So it can extend out to, I think it's about seven feet long, something like that. Um, and so the rover has several instruments contained on the end of it, so it can stretch out and be able to reach certain rocks. We have this instrument right here, which is called Pixel. And Pixel is uh, an instrument that will basically blast rocks with x-rays. And depending on how those x-rays come back into the instrument, that can tell you about what the rock is made of. Um, over here, we have a coring instrument. So this is a rock coring instrument. We'll be able to drill into a rock and take a core sample out of the rock. And then some, uh, some of those samples are going to be uh, then sent through this instrument here, which will then be brought into the body of the rover itself. And those rocks will be packaged up. And we'll talk about that in just a second as to why that's significant. Then what we can't see on the other side here is uh, the other side of the um, uh, coring instrument are a couple other instruments called Sherlock 
and Watson. <laughs> and yes, these all stand for something. No, we haven't memorized what they're all what they all stand for, but you can look it up. Anyway, Sherlock and Watson. Uh, Watson is a close up, a, a really close up camera, and Sherlock is. Um, it's kind of like Pixel, but it'll shine ultraviolet light onto rocks to be able to figure out what they're made of as well. But that coring instrument is very significant. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, so the, 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 the thing that's on the upper uh, the corner there, the closest to Michelle, um, actually has the ability to both scrape at the surface of rocks, but it can also dig into them and, and drill into them a bit. Uh, and then what that allows you to do is get it to a little bit beyond the surface of the rock. Because the rocks that are exposed to the sunlight on Mars are exposed to that sunlight. Mars doesn't have a nice uh, magnetic field like we do here on Earth. Uh, so very often, if you want to understand what the rocks were like, and maybe when R Mars was more Earth-like, you want to dig underneath the surface of that rock. So that's what that coring instrument does. It scrapes over the surface and gets you that more pristine sample of rock that you can either uh, study with the instruments here or potentially scoop up uh, for, for even more in-depth uh, analysis later that we'll get into in a bit. Mm -hmm. So we've got some antennas for communicating with Earth, and those are on so, Andrew's side. So yeah. that one right there is the ultra-high frequency antenna. That is kind of your workhorse antenna. That one will communicate with the orbiters around Mars, such as the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Mars Odyssey, to be able to then relay data and information back to Earth. Um, but there are two other uh, right there and there. Yep. So we've got a low gain antenna, which is that smaller one, and you can't really see it here. It's yes. kind of on the other side of the mast, but that would be the high gain antenna. And again, those can communicate directly with Earth, um, but they tend to use the one to, to relay the information through the orbiters. Um, that's, it's a pretty reliable method that we've been using with the other rovers for many, many years. That's actually an interesting point that there are, we'll talk more about other spacecraft, but there are now enough spacecraft in orbit around Mars that you can use them as communication relays. It's not close to the number of spacecraft we have in orbit around the Earth, but still there's a nice little fleet, so to speak, of it's, spacecraft. There. Exactly, and uh, there's one that we that NASA has even tested in the past doing a data relay through, and that is Mars Express from the European Space Agency. So we not only have have uh, orbiters from the United States, from NASA, being able to communicate with our rover. If need be, we can have even uh, orbiters from other countries communicate with our rover, which is pretty cool. So let's talk a little about uh, how this thing drives over the surface. You can see there's there the wheels here. This, this rover, uh, like the previous rovers, actually had six uh, wheels. There's three on my side, three on, on Michelle's side. They're, mount, they're all individually mounted on, the, on this bogey mount that you see here. The idea is that this thing slowly but surely drives over the surface of Mars and even in the, un, the uneven terrain, all six wheels can remain in contact with the ground as it's moving. We were joking earlier that, gee, that sure would be nice to have maybe in, uh, you know, uh, snow-covered Chicago right now. With the, <laughs> but but th then again, it, it does drive very slowly and carefully, so it might not get you to work on time. So. Well, that's okay, because usually in rush hour Chicago, when it is snowing, it, you may only be moving at a little bit less than there two inches per second, which is approximately what the speed of the rover is. I'm demonstrating approximately two inches per second. This is the speed of the rover. But the reason for that is its goal is not to do a land speed record on Mars. Its goal is to get to interesting science and interesting rocks and do interesting things. But there's only so much power available on the rover. So Andrews and over there has the, the power source for this rover. Yeah, so this is a radioactive power supply. It contains a little bit of plutonium. And that it, you can't really see it here. As Michelle said, it's sort of behind the main body of, of the rover here. But what that thing does is it slowly uh, gives off heat energy by radioactive decay. And that heat is turned into electricity directly. It doesn't generate a lot of electricity, but it's just enough to keep this thing going uh, through the cold uh, days on, on Mars. Exactly. 110 watts. That's how much power this thing puts out. So go grab a 100-watt light bulb in your house. And that is approximately the power output for this entire rover which is uh, kind of amazing to think of. <laughs> Maybe two final things that aren't really on view here that, that we'll mention, but there's an experiment that's kind of in, in this part of the, of the chassis. The, it's, a, it, it's an experiment designed to uh, test technology for future exploration of Mars. It's actually gonna breathe in the atmosphere of Mars, which is mostly carbon dioxide, and generate oxygen. It's gonna have a chemical reaction going in there, powered by electricity, and gonna make oxygen, which is gonna be very useful for potential future missions as a source of oxidizer for, for fuel, for rockets, but also potentially for humans to breathe, yep. which is a really uh, exciting test of technology. Yeah, so the test will uh, potentially create about a, as much oxygen as it, as it takes to keep a small dog alive. No, there is no dog riding on the river. 
Um, but that's about how much oxygen this will produce. It's not there to produce lots of it. It's just there to produce it at all and make sure that that this technology that this technology works. And then one final thing that is not depicted here, but this this rover, besides being a car, it's even an aircraft carrier. It's going to carry a small drone aircraft that's going to be mounted on the underside of the chassis here. In the early part of the mission, that will be lowered to the surface, then the rover will drive away, and then that uh, Ingenuity is its name, it's a small rotorcraft, it will unfold itself and fly and take photographs and, and, and video from its vantage point up high. They're hoping to, to fly it at, at least once. Again, it's another test of technology, but it's incredible that we get to fly around to Mars now. Exactly, and there are various cameras and things right next to me here. These are some hazard avoidance cameras. Again, these will all be in color. Uh, th those were uh, cameras in black and white before. And also inside the body of the rover, can't really picture it here either, is um, a ground penetrating radar. So we'll be able to see what is under the surface of Mars without actually having to dig down in, which is pretty cool. So, so. so that's a really quick view of, of all the stuff. Well, not all, we didn't cover everything. We've got the time <laughs> to get more into the details. But Michelle, you had an opportunity to talk to somebody on the team about, about some of these details. I did. Uh, about a week ago, I interviewed a Perseverance Rover team member, Justin Schachter. He's a graduate student at the University of Michigan. He uh, was an intern at NASA's JPL uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he got to work with the robotic arm uh, during the building and testing of Perseverance. And so we're going to take a look at that interview now. All right, joining me right now is Justin Schachter. He's a graduate student in space systems engineering at the University of Michigan, and we're so pleased that he has uh, taken a few minutes to be with us to chat. So hi, Justin, how you doing? Hey, Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here, and, uh, and thanks for having me. Oh, anytime, thank you. And so you are a member of the Perseverance Rover team, so we're gonna talk a little bit about you. Um, what's your background? How did you get into this? And we'll talk a little bit about Perseverance after that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, originally, so right now I'm 22 years old. I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Um, so just a little background to kind of know who I am to, to the viewers right now. Um, and I got my start. So I, I grew up in a little town in Connecticut called Reading and uh, went to a small public high school, not a ton of STEM classes there, but uh, I knew very much from the beginning of uh, my high school career, middle school career, that I wanted to be an engineer um, and even more wanted to be an aerospace engineer, just the looking up at NASA missions as a kid and watching Apollo 13 and, you know, all these cool space movies. Like, I was like, I want to be a part of that action. I want to be a part of one of these missions. Um, and then, you know, curiosity when I was a kid, just it, it really sealed, sealed the deal for me. And so I... I to the University of Michigan um, and then I studied aerospace engineering as an undergrad um, and got my bachelor's and graduated in 2020 so just this past April uh, so uh, pretty recent and then I'm continuing at the University of Michigan getting my graduate degree in space systems engineering um, and so that's a one-year program I'll be graduating in December uh, and hopefully uh, continuing on at JPL and so I guess the past few years uh, I've been an intern at JPL and and um, and been helping out with a few different things and Perseverance and Mars 2020 uh, have been one of those things. That's cool. So you mentioned you're an intern. I know that we'll probably have a lot of students watching or kids who may go, how in the world do you get to be an intern at JPL? And we were chatting a little while ago and there's quite a few people who get to be interns at JPL. So this is not unheard of. How, how do you get to do that? Yeah, so JPL, uh, has a really big internship program. Um, and every summer, uh, I'd say lab, so what we call lab, so uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, our campus, instead of saying on campus, we say on lab. So to lab, we bring probably 500 to 600 students every summer. Um, it was a bit challenging this year uh, during the pandemic, but I think we still managed to bring on quite a few students uh, remotely. Uh, they, they were able to figure that out, but uh, on, a, on a normal year, uh, there are 500 students that influx in from all around the country, uh, even all around the world, um, and we bring in international students as well. So um, yeah, every summer that happens, and then occasionally you'll get students that come in year round. So uh, whether it's popping in for a fall semester, uh, whether it's you you know go to you're in a high school in the local area and you come in and you work with the education office to uh, study underneath some engineers or some scientists. Um, uh, there's all sorts of possibilities and uh, people get to do all sorts of cool work um, and uh, hopefully I get to tell you a little bit about uh, 
some some of what myself and some of my friends have been able to do. Nice. Well, why don't we just dive into that? So you are involved with the robotic arm. So I'm going to bring up an, a, a drawing of the robotic arm and the instrumentation on the front. So our folks will be able to see that. So can you tell our uh, our viewers just a little bit about the part of the rover that you get to work on? Yeah. So um, the robotic arm is the two meter long arm attached to the uh, front side of uh, Mars 2020 or Perseverance rover. Um, and on the end of it, it's got uh, all sorts of cool tools. We've got a drill. We've got uh, the Sherlock science instrument, which is an ultraviolet spectrometer. We can use it to figure out the mineral composition of what, what is on the ground below us. Uh, we've got Pixel, which is an X-ray spectrometer, uh, which allows us to uh, detect signs of past life. Uh, on the surface. And uh, we've also got a drill. Um, and uh, that drill is pretty special. So we can drill holes in rocks, but we can also take pouring samples and uh, bring them close to the arm or close to the rover body, put them inside the body, and then store them in these uh, sample caching tubes where we can drop them on the surface uh, and then pick them up at a later date with a future mission. So the arm is really versatile. Uh, it's a uh, five degree of freedom arm, so we can move it all around uh, in free space. Um, and uh, we can use the cameras on board to figure out where it is. And we, we also have a pretty good idea from the sensors on board. Um, and we can place it very, very accurately on the surface with, the, with a good amount of force. That's really cool. Well, why don't we get into uh, a little bit of that as well. You've gotten to do some testing with the arm, quite a bit of it. So I'm gonna bring up an image of, uh, kind of of you <laughs> with the uh, <laughs> with the robotic arm. So I'll bring that up. And uh, there you are <laughs> yep. on, the, on the computer screen. So you were that's not <laughs> actually with it, but that's that's the other cool thing is you can do all this remotely. Um, but what's going on in this picture? What are we looking at? Yeah, so I guess there's a little bit of context. Uh, I've been working on Mars 2020. Uh, for just a little bit under a year now. So I started back in March of last year uh, and I was working remote uh, and I've been working remote the whole time from Michigan um, in Ann Arbor. And so labs in Pasadena, all the rover hardware is in Pasadena. My whole team is in Pasadena. Um, but when I came onto the team, uh, one of my first tasks was to help get trained to operate in the test bed. The test bed for uh, the folks that aren't uh, super familiar is the whole half of the mission that happens uh, on earth. So. And we send these crazy sp space missions um, from JPL all around the solar system. Um, and people always ask like, how do you know if it's gonna work or how do you get it to work? And the magic really happens on the ground with the really talented team uh, at JPL uh, in the test beds and, and even uh, around other venues around the country and, and, and uh, the world as well. And so um, in the test bed, we have uh, varying levels of fidelity of hardware. So, uh, down to mass models where it's just a hunk of metal that's supposed to simulate a subsystem on the rover, uh, all the way up to the engineering models, which were near flight-like versions that we get to use to test and practice our, uh, our sequences with, our, you know, do full operational readiness tests, which are full operational day simulations uh, on Mars uh, that we get to do on, on the ground here. Um, what we're looking at here in this, in this picture specifically is the flight software test bed. So it's a um, a test bed where we have uh, the robotic arm. So this is the engineering uh, model arm. So uh, it's a very flight-like version of what we've sent to Mars, except for it's just been used here on Earth for testing. And so that's, that's kind of the difference. So it's, uh, we had three versions of the arm and this one performed uh, not as well as the one that we sent to Mars. So we get to use it here on Earth. Um, and this was back in August. So, you know, right now it's, uh, in February, right before we land. Uh, this was back in August. And I guess there's another image you could pull up as well uh, while we're doing testing in, so we launched in July. And when we launched, uh, we still had some testing to do. And uh, we, our team on the robotic arm systems engineering team, as well as other systems engineering teams for other systems on board the rover, uh, got to do a bunch of testing after we launched as well. So we, we tested to make sure we would be able to land safely on Mars. Then we got to test all of our cool performance uh, and, and features uh, after we launched, before we landed. And that's what we were looking at. So uh, the arm was looking like this. So it's in this cool pose. Uh, and I was operating it from my room in Ann Arbor, uh, which was the coolest part about all of that. While that hardware was in Pasadena uh, and my teammate was holding up a computer of me uh, on video <laughs> chat while I was controlling the arm from my room. So that was super, super cool. 
That's cool. And so I've got a little bit of a time lapse video of uh, the movement of the arm. And so I'll do my best to uh, show this uh, probably a couple different times. So give me just a second. And there we go. All right. So it's moving. It looks like it's quick, but how quick really is this? What is what is it doing? Yeah, so the arm, it's its a very capable arm. It's got uh, five motors on board and they're very, very uh, solid motors. They, um, they can go pretty fast. Uh, I forget the exact speed, um, but uh, in practice, so this is, this, is a play, this is a venue we call ATLO or assembly test and launch operations. So this is like the clean room um, where, it, you know, people are in bunny suits. So this is the real hardware that is on Mars right now. Uh, or, or not right now, but hopefully <laughs> in a few minutes or hours uh, when this gets shown. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, so this is uh, this is moving pretty slowly. So the arm, you know, if I could simulate it with my with my arm, is you know going like, and you you could hear the audio for the you know if we could share that link with the with the audience, they could pull it up on their own computers. Um, and I think there's. A uh, video somewhere I sent as well, um, where you can actually hear that arm moving and seeing it move in real time, and it's it is it's very very slow. Um, and we do that for a reason because you know even though we can move it fast, we can drive the rover somewhat fast. We we drive the rover slow. We move all of our mechanisms really slowly to make sure that we're operating them safely on Mars and even on Earth. You know we we could move them a lot faster, speed up some tests, but we don't because uh, you know we want to make sure the people that are around it are safe, um, but also that the hardware stays safe as well. And we don't hurt it. Yeah, and when it's on Mars, it's not like there's an alien standing there with a watch going, I'm waiting, I'm, I'm waiting, come on, we got to speed this up. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly, yeah. yep, yes, yeah, so there's, yep, there's no one, <laughs> no one, no one checking us, uh, no, no one pushing us along. It's just, you know, if, if we can get everything done and we can do it all, uh, you know, in due time, then so be it. These missions, you know, they're, I think the, I remember Spirit and Opportunity, they were supposed to last 19 days and they lasted multiple years. Uh, or many, many years. Uh, and so, you know, when you have many years to do something, you don't need to, to run fast on a planet. Um, right, right. Yeah, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, nominal or perfect mission was was 90 days. Can you imagine? Spirit lasted for, what, six or seven years? Opportunity was 14? I mean, just, it, you guys really build this stuff to last and, and, and work a long time. So that'll be pretty exciting. And you also shared with me a, an image that people probably never thought they would see, um, which uh, give me just a second and I'll bring that up. It's a picture of um, uh, the rover without its robotic arm. So yep. uh, let me bring that up. There it is. So my goodness, it, this is it, it looks weird to see the see this picture. So uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is the Mars Yard over at JPL. So this is a venue if anybody comes to a, a public tour of JPL, uh, which uh, I hope you all do. Uh, it's a very cool thing to come see uh, see us all work and, and see all the hardware uh, in real life. Um, so this is a, a venue you walk down lab and there's just a couple sheds and we've got uh, the door right behind uh, Perseverance here that is closed. That's got the Earth version of Curiosity uh, that we, we practice with. And so this is our Earth twin um, and it's, it's a near flight-like version. Uh, there's no radio thermal generator on the back, so there's uh, uh, it, that's pretty safe. So we've it's got it's tied to an umbilical where it can get power and data back to uh, our computers and our, our hardware on the ground. But it's uh, perseverance without an arm, and uh, I think that's a weird thing to see. But uh, this picture was taken in September. Uh, the photo you showed earlier when uh, we were in the test bed uh, of me with uh, with my thumbs up that was in August. And the reason why this version of the rover doesn't have an arm because that arm was in a different test bed uh, that we were testing with. So. Uh, we have a couple different venues that we swap hardware between uh, to test different things. Uh, and so, uh, you know, one day if anybody in the audience comes to JPL, hopefully you'll see an arm on this uh, on this rover uh, driving around and practicing what we're doing on Mars. So the key is testing, testing, testing. You've, you've sent this expensive equipment that you, you need to work and you don't want to break it. And uh, you just you keep testing as much as possible. So in total, how how many how many rovers and bits of rovers and things are are scattered all over? There's there's a lot of testing going on. What's what to give us a sense of scale? How many bits are we talking about? So um so by bits I so we have all right so there's 
So one, these, these, these pieces of hardware are really expensive. So we would love to have a hundred of them just to, just to play <laughs> around with. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so one thing cannot emphasize that enough. We test, test, test um, until we are, uh, we're never a hundred percent sure. Uh, pot, like optimism, um, uh, you know, while you're testing uh, can be uh, the end of a bad day. Um, and uh, so we have the flight version. So that's called the flight model of the FM. And then we have the engineering model one and engineering model two. And then we have a couple uh, less flight-like quality uh, arms that we use to just kind of simulate things, but we have three. So we have uh, engineering model one, engineering model two, and then the flight model. That's amazing. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And I would, I would echo your statements that if uh, when, when everything is safe, uh, if you ever see that JPL is doing a, a JPL open house, it, it usually in the past has happened in the spring. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. You have to get tickets in advance and, and sign up. But um, I, the one time I did get to visit, it was just a magical experience to be able to see um, essentially where it all happens. And you got to do that both in person and remotely. So um, uh, what's your feeling on all this? So what if you were telling someone uh, just trying to sum up your experiences so far with perseverance and yet to come. Uh, what would you what would you say? First of all, it's incredible. I mean, just getting to be a part of this team and a part of a mission of this scale is uh, it, it is uh, to say the least a treat. And uh, I'd say it's one of the best experiences I will ever have in my life. Um, it's 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 really really cool to be a part of the action. Um, but it's, it's also something that, you know, even though it seems like straight out of a dream, which to me, I get to wake up, get to turn on my computer. And, you know, even if it's not the most fun thing every day to, you know, read through emails, you know, the days I'm getting to do the cool things, uh, I look back and I'm like, wow, how, how am I doing this? And um, it is, it's something, you know, if, if people are passionate, it's something where if it's something you really want to do, it is achievable. Um, it's something where it all starts by talking, you know, just throwing a question out in the air of, to an engineer um, about something you're interested in. Uh, it could even be, you know, something where you throw in an application uh, as a student, uh, whether you're in high school or college, uh, to you know come work with us and get the ball rolling and and just catch enough momentum to, to hang around long enough till you know you get to land something on another planet one day as well. Well, we're going to put the links to the images and videos and things that we showed uh, during this session, but also we're going to put the link to get more information about internships at uh, JPL and other NASA centers, because there are other NASA centers around the country, all doing different things. And so we hope that uh, there might be some uh, students out there in our audience who might want to do this and do what you're doing in the future. So Justin, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope you can visit us at the other planetarium someday soon. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for having me. Well, that certainly was a treat to talk to Justin and he was planning on watching today. So if you are out there, Justin, um, thank you so much on behalf of the other planetarium for doing that interview with me. And he wanted to give a special shout out to a few people on the Rover team. We have uh, Doug Klein, the robotic arm science phase lead, Christina Hernandez, the pixel payload systems engineer, and Zach Bailey, the Sherlock payload systems engineer, Justin said that those folks played a large part in making what he did possible at JPL, but also part of the reason we'll be successful on, on the surface if we land safely today, along with many others that he said he could have taken hours to list all those folks. But that's really important to stress. These missions don't just involve the few folks that you're gonna see on screen, maybe if you watch the NASA feed, it isn't just those people, there are literally thousands of people involved in a mission like this and they're all over the world too which is just which is incredible exactly yeah. exactly and justin also wanted me to mention something that's important to the students in our audience especially carol slavin's uh ogden jenner uh, campus uh, so carol slavin's is that ogden jenner campus chicago public schools and also mrs burns fourth grade class in knapp forest elementary in grand rapids michigan um, and then dan chrislau who is a science teacher from denmark Hey, everybody out there, you want to do what Justin did? You can be an intern at NASA. And so we put the link to the intern page um, uh, on the NASA website into the description for this show. They take literally hundreds of interns each year. And Justin wanted me to mention, it does not matter what school you, you are at, where you come from. 
They accept folks from all walks of life all over the world to be able to come and, and do some of those exciting things that Justin got to do. So he wanted me to, to really talk to you guys. So pretty cool. So actually, we have a little bit of time. We've got maybe five, six minutes. Do you want to you answer some questions? Let's do some questions. Okay, yeah, let's answer absolutely. Some questions. All right, we're going to take a look and see what we've got. Okay. So how about... Can ooh. you land the sky crane without crashing it is one of an interesting yeah. question. What do you think? We're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to find out. The answer is yes, because as we said before, the previous rover that landed on Mars also used the sky crane system, and it worked brilliantly. So... We hope so is the answer. Yeah, we hope so. That's that's a key. We don't know until it all happens whether or not this thing will land safely. We get one shot to do it right, one chance. And so that's the key through, through all of this is uh, to see what happens along the way. Here's another question about uh, you often uh, some people paying attention to the to the mission have seen the seven minutes of terror, you know, when we don't know if it's landed safely. And the question is, is this different from others? Or are they all this risky? You know what? They're all risky in, in different ways. So it might not be exactly seven minutes, uh, you know, depending on the mission, but they all have this time where uh, in, in our case, the the the, the, time, the signal delay um, is more like 11 minutes. But we'll, we'll know 11 minutes after the fact. Uh, when we get the signals from Mars, whether or not we have a successful landing. And so everybody's, you know, biting their nails and, and waiting. So stay tuned. Uh, here's another question. Uh, what time is the landing? But there's also a few uh, related questions about the time difference in between Earth and Mars. So uh, we'll have more about that in just a second. But uh, the, the landing time, the time when we will get the signal, we hope, on Earth that it has landed successfully is approximately 2.55 p.m., central time. Um, so when I say we hope, there actually are some scenarios where we may not get the information back instantly. So uh, right away, meaning um, there could be uh, information lost in the middle of landing. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, the, the landing has gone bad. It just means that maybe we just don't have the information. Um, so the, the, the key is 2.55 p.m. is when we get the signal on Earth. And a little over 11 minutes earlier um, is, is when it actually landed. So if you start looking at your clock, what, about 244? Let's go say, yeah. It's landed on Mars. No matter what, it has gotten there, <laughs> either in one piece or in many pieces. We are hoping a, 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 a healthy uh, <laughs> rover that will we be hope communicating so. with. We hope so. Hey, I, I, get, get, I, I'd like, I love this question. Uh, you know, if, if people live on Mars... Would they need a special suit to help to help them breathe? The answer is absolutely yes. If you were to go to Mars, well, first of all, I do not recommend it. Uh, it's a very expensive trip, but also the conditions are not very optimal. Uh, you would be it would be too cold for you. You'd you'd freeze uh, like a popsicle. But also there's no oxygen and the air pressure is is very very low. So yes, you would absolutely need a special spacesuit that you'd have to uh, provide breathing air. Uh, but then also there's a few other interesting threats to human life on Mars. Uh, the um, as I think we said before, Mars doesn't have a, a, radi a, a magnetic field that protects us, uh, Mars from from so some bad effects of solar radiation. But then, in addition, the dust on Mars. Mars is a very dusty world. It's covered with this orangey red dust, which is why it's called the red planet. It actually is covered with this dust. It's very fine dust that is actually harmful to your to, to your breathing. And so that that needs to be filtered out. All kinds of things that need to be done if we were to, in the future, make it safe for people to be there. Got a great student question. Um, what happens if the rover crashes or has a rough landing on Mars? Will it break? And the answer kind of is it depends on how hard it lands. <laughs> so, but even an actual perfect landing could result in, in a problem. So when Curiosity landed, uh, those, those rockets, those downward facing rockets that slowed it down, it appears that they kicked up some rocks that then landed on the top of the rover. So if one of those rocks hits something important, important yeah. and it's a big enough rock, um, then yeah, that could be bad. So even if the rover lands safely, there still could be issues that happen. So it's never 100% guaranteed. Just like we can't make cars 100% safe on the Earth, we can't make landing on Mars completely safe for the rover. So. There's actually a question here that's a, a good uh, segue into talking about the, the whole planet. There's somebody submitted a question about are there plans to send a rover to the north or south pole of Mars? Well, to answer that question, let's go to the globe, shall we? We shall. So here we are. This is Mars, obviously not real scale. This is this is this is a globe. 
But Mars, as you saw in the imagery before, does have these polar ice caps. So this, if we turn it, we can show you the North Pole of Mars that has that ice cap. And I'll just turn it around a little bit uh, slowly to show you also the South Pole of Mars. Now this shows the the uh, summer in both hemispheres. Mars has seasons like the Earth does, and so the ice coverage that you see here does wax and wane with with the seasons. So there's a northern hemisphere, southern uh, northern hemisphere uh, winter uh, and summer. The ice that we see there at the polar ice caps is a, is a mixture of water ice and carbon dioxide or dry ice, right? Uh, and but then getting to the question is that are there plans to send a a, a rover? Well, not a rover, but a but a lander. Uh, the answer is yes, and in fact, it, it, it's happened. There was a lander called Phoenix. We've actually marked it on this globe, which is, mm -hmm. where is it? Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Didn't land right on the, on, on, at the pole there, but close to the pole. The, the intent of that mission was to understand the surface of Mars and look for uh, layers of ice either at the surface or right underneath the surface. This was not a rover, but it landed there, and the, the thrust from the rockets as it was landing actually scooped up enough dust you could actually see the ice just just beneath that layer of dust that covers uh, every everything on Mars. Fortunately, there was a camera that could look underneath the the, the lander that got a good view of that. Uh, so that's a overview. While we've got the globe here, if we go out to the whole thing, we've marked this globe with different landing sites. Our landing site today is right there. We'll talk a lot more about that landing site in a bit. But this also shows the landing sites of the Viking landers. There's Viking 1 that landed in, in the 1970s. Also Pathfinder, which was the first rover to go to Mars. That was a rover that was only about yay big in, in, in real size. They've gotten much bigger uh, since then. Uh, and then Curiosity, help me, Michelle, where's Curiosity? Oh, there it is, there, there, it, is. there it is, yeah, uh, which is still operating. That's another rover that is the twin, well, not an exact twin, but it's the same kind of chassis size, size. Mm -hmm. as the one that you see here, that is still driving over the, over the surface there. And Viking 2, that also landed in the 70s, is, uh, is up there. So we use globes like this to help us understand what planets look like, right? Mm -hmm. This particular globe was made by imagery from the Mariner 9 spacecraft, which was the first spacecraft to orbit around Mars. In fact, the first spacecraft to orbit around any other planet b besides the Earth. And since then, of course, we've got much more detailed imagery. We can, uh, we can get a closer view. And uh, one last thing, you'll notice that a lot of these, or all, almost all these landing sites are near the equator. It's it's better to land near the equator on Mars. You wanna you wanna potentially land in a place that's a little warmer. Mars gets pretty frigid, and so if you land near the equator, uh, your just overall temperatures that you're gonna experience are a little bit warmer, and it's just easier to land near an equator. Yeah, and an interesting uh, comment about the about the landing sites is that the early landing sites were chosen intentionally to be safe landing sites, right? They they took images from the orbiting spacecraft and looked for smooth areas because they wanted it to be. A, a place where a lander could get there safe and sound. Nowadays, the more recent images, including the one that we've got landing today, they're able to much better control where it lands. So they take, it's fair to say, a little bit higher risk because they want to get to some scientifically interesting areas. We'll get into the, that a, a little bit later, but the way we choose landing sites has changed over the years. But we can do you one better. We've got a globe here, which I don't know about you. I love looking at globes and maps and things, and I know a bunch of you do too but we can do you better. We're here at the planetarium. Why don't we show you some planetarium related technology and take you to Mars. So we're gonna use a, a technology, an open source technology called Open Space. And Open Space is a way to essentially uh, show you a digital view of the universe. And so we're gonna show you a digital fly to Mars. Yep, so as Michelle said, we do this every day in the planetarium world, so let's do it today on, on, on uh, online. So Mike produced this, so let's go ahead and take you to Mars. So. As you see now, we're flying through, we should say, we're flying at, at physically impossible speeds right now. We're going much faster than the speed of, of light, but we're approaching Mars. That line that you see going to the left is the orbit of orbital path of Mars around the sun. Those two other lines that you see are the orbits of the moons of, of, uh, of Mars, called Phobos and Deimos. We're going in now to that north pole of Mars. You saw it in the globe. This is in the, it's closer to winter, so there's a lot more ice coverage there. Now we're fading to a new area, we're actually going to Olympus Mons. This is the largest volcano on Mars, and in fact, it's the largest volcano anywhere in the solar system. It's part of a complex of volcanoes called the Tharsis Plateau, and these giant volcanoes developed, and they got so big, it actually bulged the whole crust of Mars out in, in, in this part of uh, the planet. It's a very volcanic world. Now we're flying over the 
the Vallis Marineris, which is the largest canyon on Mars. And again, it's the largest canyon we've seen anywhere in the solar system. This thing, if it were on the, on the Earth, would stretch across the US 48 states from coast to coast, much bigger than that Grand Canyon we have in Arizona. So as we continue flying, we're going toward Gale Crater. Gale Crater is where Curiosity is located right now. And Curiosity is operating. It's been there for almost 10 years. And in the middle of that crater is a place called Mount Sharp. It's a, about a three mile tall mountain in the middle of about a hundred mile wide crater. Um, and so this is showing you uh, what appears to be a dried river valley. But finally, we're heading toward Jezero Crater. And Jezero Crater is the landing location for the Perseverance rover. And um, when we go in toward that crater, it's about a 28 mile wide crater, so a tiny spot. And Perseverance is aiming for a location within that crater that's about six miles wide. So we're, we're aiming for a bullseye spot on Mars. So it's at the upper margin now, and now the view is, is centering on the landing site. You see that thing, it looks like a squiggly line coming from the top, and then it kind of splashes out in the middle. That is what looks like a delta. It looks very similar to a river delta here on Earth, and we think that this formed by moving water. So it was, that channel was, was helped to be carved and formed by water, and then that water flowed into what was a crater. The crater predated the, the movement of the water, and then that wa moving water deposited a lot of sediment there, so these small particles, and it formed this feature that we're going to be visiting with this rover. And that was one of the main reasons that this landing site was chosen, because it looks like there was water moving over the surface, so we want to see what uh, the surface of Mars looked like back then, uh, and also how the climate on Mars has changed, because it used to be more uh, Earth-like, and now it is not. I can't wait to see what uh, what some of those uh, rock formations are going to look like in the in the near distant uh, uh, location of where the rover ends up. But yep. the scientists obviously had good reasons for for picking this spot. You've gotten to sit in on some of these discussions when the scientists are trying to figure out where where the heck do we land on a planet. So what are those like? Yeah, you, you might wonder, well, how do you decide where to go when you're going uh, all the way to Mars? Well, it's a discussion in the science community. So there are different scientists that get together and they recommend different landing sites. Very often they're looking for places where, uh, again, as I said before, we're trying to find evidence for changes on Mars. Because these features that you just saw with that visualization show water flowing over the surface. Now today, liquid water like that cannot exist on Mars because the air is too thin and is too cold. If you were to take a bottle of water to Mars, it would either freeze solid really quickly or it would boil away into a gas. There is water on Mars today. It's either if locked up in frozen uh, ice or it's in water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and there might be some suggestions of tiny amounts of water on the surface, but, but not big lakes or, or ponds or mighty rivers like, like what we saw that may have formed that, that, that delta. Right? So very often scientists choose different areas that look like they suggest there's it's evidence that there was a more Earth-like past. And then what the scientists do is, is they, they submit their ideas, and it's a discussion. You get together and you, you argue back and forth. You have these really interesting science arguments about why my, my landing site is better than, than your landing site. Some of the landing sites don't get chosen for this one mission, but they get chosen for, for future missions. Uh, and this particular one rose to the top in, in part because it looked like there was clear evidence of this more Earth-like past that we wanted to... Uh, get an understanding because one of the questions that we try to understand with, with our science of planetary science is trying to see how common are these Earth-like environments? Is how, how possible is it for these kinds of possibly habitable environments to exist on other worlds? Here's case in point is to uh, maybe your landing site doesn't get chosen now, but it might in the future. Uh, Gale Crater, where Curiosity is, was a potential landing site for spirit or opportunity, but it wasn't chosen because at the time, we weren't as good at landing spacecraft on Mars. And the, the ellipse, the, the area they could target, was longer than the crater, than Gale Crater is wide. And so they couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't crash the, the rover on landing into the side of the crater or accidentally land it on the top of Mount Sharp. And so they, they said, OK, we'll hold that one off. We'll wait till we're better at it. And so then they got Curiosity landing there successfully. Yeah. So. So that's why there's got a lot of interest there and a lot of different spacecraft going to Mars. Exactly. So there's two spacecraft that arrived recently. And uh, there was one from the United Arab Emirates. It's called Al-Amal. And uh, Al-Amal, the name means hope. And that spacecraft arrived on February 9th into orbit around Mars. And it's going to study the atmosphere and weather of Mars. And there'll be a comprehensive 
first time that we've been able to do that. So congratulations to them. And then China recently sent an orbiter into uh, Mars orbit and that arrived February 10th. And that will be a combination orbiter and then later lander and rover. So it's all together. And if all goes well in a few months, they will try to land the uh, lander with its rover on the surface of Mars. Um, but you may be wondering, wait a minute. So Al Amal on February 9th, the Chinese spacecraft, which um, the name means questioning the heavens or heavenly questions. Uh, so that arrived February 10th and Perseverance is arriving on the 18th. Is this a coincidence? Seems like a traffic jam. Yes, it does seem like a traffic jam. Is Mars getting crowded now? There's plenty of space. <laughs> no. <laughs> but this is not a coincidence. There are certain times when we send spacecraft to Mars. So we recorded a quick little activity to show you how that works. Mars isn't just interesting to look at in the sky with our eyes or our telescopes. We send spacecraft to Mars every few years. The Perseverance rover is arriving today, but it's not the only newcomer to Mars. A few weeks ago, we had two other arrivals at Mars, the Orbiter Hope from the United Arab Emirates and a lander, rover, and orbiter from China called Tianwen. All of these missions launched about eight months ago. So can't we just send spacecraft to Mars anytime we want? Well, the answer is no, we can't. Sending spacecraft to another planet really is rocket science. What you want to do is make your mission as cheap as possible. And you want to use as little fuel as possible. You also want to make your rocket as light as possible because a lighter rocket uses less fuel and makes your mission a little less expensive. So the best time to launch your spacecraft is around the time when Earth and Mars are closest to each other in space. We call this opposition. So what exactly is opposition? Opposition occurs when Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun. So we have Earth here and Mars here on our model. Now launch for Mars occurs a little before opposition and the spacecraft launches and follows a curved path to get to where Mars will be in the future. Now this curved path is about 300 million miles long. So to put this in comparison, that's like hitting a golf ball from Los Angeles and trying to hit a hole in one at a specific golf course in Scotland. So what are we aiming for on Mars? We're aiming for a spot six miles wide. So would you like to do an activity to illustrate launching a spacecraft from Earth to Mars? All you need is a spinning chair, or the next time you head to the playground, head for the merry-go-round. Get yourself some small balls, some wadded up pieces of paper, or in this case, some bean bags, and you want a bucket. So you will want to put your bucket a few feet away from your chair or merry-go-round. So get yourself spinning, not too fast, and try to launch your spacecraft to Mars. You can see it can be kind of hard. How can you make it harder? Make your bucket smaller. Or move it farther away from your chair or the merry-go-round. Or even harder, hand your bucket to a willing helper to move the bucket as you are spinning. This will simulate Mars moving through space. Give it a try. Good luck. Joe? Thank you. <laughs> oh. I, I actually, I wasn't very good at tossing the spacecraft into the bucket, was I? No. No, hey, but, but that's okay. <laughs> to, get a, to get a spacecraft all the way to Mars, it, it's the same principle, just a lot more precision. That's all good. true. Yeah. That's true. NASA's much better at it than I am. So <laughs> anyway, we've talked all about Mars, and but we haven't really given you a sense of scale of the size of Mars, have we? So let's do a little, another little activity here. We have um, some, uh, some sports balls sitting on top of the table here. We are going to pretend that this one, a Chicago softball, uh, is Earth, all right? On this scale, if we shrunk Earth down to the size of this ball right here, which of these balls would be the right size for Mars? So we're gonna give you a, a, a chance to, to put that in the chat. So we have a soccer ball. Is it the soccer ball? Is it the baseball? Is it the wooden ball 
or is it the red ball? And please don't consider the color to be an indicator of the actual answer. This one just happened to be red. And so, remember, this is Earth. That is Earth. Right. On this scale, which one of these represents Mars? So we'll come back to that answer in a second. So go ahead and put your guesses into the chat, and we will see who was correct. Okay. So we've told you about the rover. We've told you a bit about its mission. We've told you a bit about size, and we'll get to that answer in just a few minutes. We've told you a bit about landing locations, and NASA has produced a really interesting video talking even a bit more about what this rover is going to do. So let's take a look at that video. You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us. For the first time, we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. That is a pretty exciting mission, it right? It sure is. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, we gave you a task before we saw that video on this scale, how big is Mars? So, so if, if this is Earth. Yep, if that's Earth. Is Mars the soccer ball? Nope. No. Too big. Too big. <laughs> is Mars the wooden ball? Nope, not the wooden ball. Is Mars the little guy, the little red one? No, we didn't want to tell you from color or anything like that. No, this is, this is too small. But on this scale, yeah, it's basically the baseball. So Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth. And so uh, on this scale, though, I did bring the wooden ball out. The moon is approximately half the diameter of Mars. And so this just gives you a sense of scale with the planets here. So there you go. Now, what's really interesting about, we always like using models like this to show how planets are, are different. Uh, yeah, if you hold up the, the, the baseball there. So Mars, the planet that we're visiting today, is about half as far across as Earth is. It's just amazing to me that there are all these incredible features, like the biggest canyons in the solar system, the biggest volcanoes in the solar system, all on a planet that's half, half the, the diameter there of Earth. But another interesting thing about the scale is that how far apart do you think Mars and Earth actually are at this scale? 
So is this how close they are? No, the answer is no. If they, maybe if Michelle, you threw the baseball as hard as you could that way, don't do it. Okay. Ah. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay. And I'll throw the, <laughs> this, the softball as far as that way. Is that how far apart? The answer is no. In fact, at this scale, to, to, to actually represent where Mars and Earth are roughly right now, they'd have to be how far apart? About a mile and a half. That's right. <laughs> so it, it shows you that, that it's actually really hard to represent scale of the size of planets and also the, their distances. We have scale models of, of planets in the solar system here at the Adler, but it's difficult uh, to show how far apart they are. It's just really amazing that, you know, most of space is, guess what, empty space. And there really is a far distance that you need to travel uh, to, to get uh, between these worlds. It's amazing that we can visit these places from so far away. It's amazing we can do it at all, yep. right? So I have a question for you. We've talked about, uh, we've shown the video about the rover's mission and talked about packaging up the samples and bring, and then eventually maybe we'll bring some of those back to Earth at some point. But wait a minute, we're sending this big, giant, expensive robot geologist isn't that enough? Why Why would we need to bring some of those rocks back? So these spacecraft that go to Mars are getting more and more capable as the years go by. And we already heard before, we described the different instruments. We can see what the rocks are made of. With the, with the instruments, especially at the arm and at the top of the mass cam there, they're actually able to identify the elements that are contained in within individual grains of the rock. If you look very closely at a rock with a magnifying glass, you can see there's, there's different uh, grains in there. So it's amazing that we have that capability. But there are still some things we can do on Earth-bound laboratories that you can't do even with a very complicated rover like this. You could see even finer, finer details if you have a full lab here on Earth. You could put it into uh, the kinds of uh, uh, microscopes that we can use to see really, really tiny details, much, much uh, smaller than are possible with the rover. You can do things like uh, identify, if it's a volcanic rock, how many billions of years ago it cooled down to form that solid rock. That's not something you can uh, quite do um, uh, on, a, on a, a, sp a spacecraft. The other reason, uh, there are many reasons, but, but another good reason is that our ability to do science with these samples keeps advancing all the time. So who knows what you'll be able to do 10, 20 years from now if you get a sample back and keep it safe and stored in a laboratory. I think a great um, analogy there um, is the samples that we returned from the moon. So Apollo astronauts picked up all these rocks and brought them back and they're stored at a, at a NASA uh, a facility. And nowadays scientists still use those samples they were doing kinds of experiments that weren't even dreamed about decades ago. And the only reason that that science is, is really possible is because we have those samples back here on Earth. And we made the conscious effort and choice back then to hold out some samples and say, look, 20, 30, 50 years in the future, in this case, that we will have advanced technology enough that we can ask even more difficult questions than we could ever have asked before. Science, another, science progresses. Another fun thing about, about these samples is that it actually lets you uh, uh, sometimes, literally, touch these other worlds. Yes, and so we have a special collection here at the Adler. I'm going to show you one in just a little bit, but we have a quick video to show you some very special, touchable rock samples from very special places in the solar system. Well, so let's take a look at that video. Welcome back to our solar system gallery. Now, here at the Adler Planetarium, we have a pretty unique collection that you can see up close and touch. This may be the only place on planet Earth where you can touch five different pieces of meteorites. Now, what exactly is a meteorite? A meteorite happens when you have some bits in space, some rocks, some metal, and sometimes those bits run into the Earth. If they're large enough to survive down to the ground, we call that a meteorite. Now, we have five meteorites here. This one that I have right next to me is a piece of Mars. Now, you may wonder, how did a rock from Mars get to Earth? Well, something from space smashed into the planet Mars. Rocks escaped from the surface, and some of them are going fast enough that they went out into space. They traveled through space and landed on planet Earth. So we have rocks from the planet Mars here on the surface of the Earth. This little piece was identified by scientists as having come from the planet Mars. We also have three asteroid meteorites and a meteorite from the moon. Now you may wonder how we know these rocks are from these places. That's a great question. In the case of the moon, we've been there. 
we have about 800 pounds of rocks that astronauts brought back from the moon on the Apollo missions to compare them to. As for asteroids, asteroids formed at about the same time as the solar system formed. So these rocks are usually about four and a half billion years old. And while there are old rocks on the Earth's surface, there are no Earth rocks that are that old because Earth's surface is reshaped and reformed over time. There are other characteristics of the materials that we can look for too. In the case of Mars, we have sent spacecraft to Mars, and so we have information about the types of rocks that are there. In some of the rocks, there are tiny air bubbles trapped. When scientists study the air in those bubbles, it matches Mars and not the Earth. If you visit the Adler Planetarium in the future, check out these special rocks. It's exciting to know that these pieces of outer space are right here on Earth. So we're really proud here at the Adler that we have, as far as we know, the only place on planet Earth where you can come touch so many pieces of outer space. And so we hope that when we're open in the future, you can come and explore that for yourself. But I do have a special little rock here to show you too. Um, we have... This, what, what Michelle is holding in her hand right now, is a piece of Mars. So this is one of these meteorites. Uh, just like the one, somewhat similar to the one she was talking about before that is touchable in the museum exhibit. It's still focusing. There we go. And it's a tiny piece of the of the rock. And this, as I said, was a meteorite. Um, and we know it's a piece of Mars for the reasons that Michelle mentioned. We, we, can, we, we know what gases are trapped in there. And Michelle, actually, why don't you show, show people the, the two different sides yep. of it there. So one side is smoother, that the smooth side is towards you right now. This is what we call the fusion crust. This is the this is the crust on the outside of that rock. As this thing was screaming through the atmosphere and, and heating up, uh, it, it actually melted that outer layer of, of rock to make that smooth surface that you see right there. And this is the interior of the rock. There, the rock that fell to Earth was much bigger than this. This is a little chunk that fell off. And so it was identified uh, using the various methods that scientists have to identify meteorites as an actual rock from Mars. I am literally holding a piece of the red planet in my hand, which never ceases to amaze me every single time I do it. So it, it is just incredible that we get these pieces from other worlds, right? There's a, there, there's only a, there's a few dozen of, of these meteorites that have been identified have come from Mars. We have other pieces from asteroids, as you heard before, the moon and, and, and other places like that. It's just incredible that we can literally touch these other worlds. Well, these meteorites that one of which uh, Michelle was just holding and you saw the, the video in, in our solar system gallery, Meteorites keep falling here on Earth. We have a, a, a chunk of the Park Forest meteorite that fell in, uh, outside Chicago. That, that's on display. Mm -hmm. That one is not touchable. Nope. We also had a fall that landed in Lake Michigan, and we had a, our, our scientists, engineers, and teens working together to, to help uh, uh, try to find that. Yep. It's, it's sitting at the bottom of Lake Michigan. So shout out to our Far Horizons program and our Project Aquarius uh, folks to be able to uh, investigate that fall. So these rocks are, in some cases, billions of years old. So those are probably the oldest things uh, here at the Adler that we get to share with people. But we also have other things in our museum collection that aren't quite billions of years old, but still really important touchstones for understanding the human connection with the sky. So when the Adler Planetarium was founded in 1930, Max Adler started us off with a collection of about 500 astronomical, historical astronomical instruments. And in the intervening nine decades, we've added to that collection to include uh, several thousand instruments, works on paper, and books. And so we have quite a few uh, images and things online that you can investigate, but we wanted to show you three special examples of Mars-related collections items that we have. So this video is going to be uh, playing in just a second, featuring Dr. Pedro Raposo, our curator and director of collections here at the Adler Planetarium. This is a mechanical model of the solar system, also known as a NORI. It was made by the British lecturer and instrument maker, Benjamin Martin, in the 18th century. Auris were used in the social gatherings of affluent society and in popular lectures to demonstrate how the planets move around the sun according to the theory of gravitation of Isaac Newton. When we crank the Ori, we see the planets moving around the sun and we see that the farther a planet is from the sun, the slower it moves. Note, for example, how Mercury here moves much faster than Mars, and how slowly Jupiter and Saturn are progressing along their orbits. 
Ori's excited people's imagination about the other planets and whether they could harbor life like the Earth. Ori's are also part of an array of mechanical marvels that are ancestors to our modern robots. And those include industrial robots and also planetary rovers like Mars Perseverance. Each one of these metal sculptures is what we call an automaton. An automaton is a mechanical device that simulates movements, gestures, and sounds made by people and animals. Humans have long sought to recreate life mechanically. These automata were made in Germany between the 16th century and the early 18th century. They represent respectively a lion, an ostrich, a dog, and a camel. Note that the lion sports a clock dial. These devices were often coupled to clocks and they would make movements and produce sounds to tell the hour. The original mechanisms of this automata no longer survive, but we can still see, for example, that the jaw of the lion and its tail could move. These devices were essentially show-off pieces that the powerful and the wealthy used to amuse themselves and impress their guests. But they also testify to a long quest for ever more elaborate mechanical devices that put us on track to send robotic rovers like Mars Perseverance to other planets. This Mars Globe was first published in 1973 by the Chicago firm De Neuer Gappert, which specialized in globes and eidetic materials for the educational market. The globe incorporates data from the Mariner 9 mission. In 1971, Mariner 9 became the first spacecraft to orbit another planet. It mapped 85% of the surface of the red planet, returning the first detailed images of features such as Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system, and Valles Marineris, the great canyon of Mars named after Mariner 9 itself. Mariner 9 significantly advanced our knowledge of Mars and paved the way to other exploration missions, such as Mars Perseverance, whose landing site is... Well, thank you so much, Pedro, for doing those videos for us. Yeah, that, that globe that you saw there was of the same uh, generation of the globe that we were sharing here before, although we used the, the one that you saw here for educational and outreach purposes. Uh, if you want to learn more about how we've made globes of and, and, and imagined uh, Mars, we have an online exhibition on the Google Arts and Culture platform. It's called, it's called A Martian Sensation, Maps, Delusion, and the Mars Canals. And it's all about how Mars has changed, but not in the way that it's changed in terms of the climate, but how Mars has changed and evolved in the human imagination. At one point, there were thought to be canals on Mars and maybe civilizations that were building these canals to help uh, feed and water cities. We now know that's not the, that's not the case, but check that out online uh, for more about that. Yep, the link to that is in the main program description uh, for this YouTube show. So if you wanna go check that out after you're done with us, please do. All right, so um, about a week ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to interview another Mars Rover team member. This is Stephanie Oy and she is a member of the Perseverance Rover team. So let's take a look at her interview and she's gonna tell you about what she does for the rover mission. All right, joining me right now is Stephanie Oy. She is the Scientific Applications Software Engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really great to have you on the show. My pleasure. Excellent. So we want to talk a little bit about you. Um, we'll get to what you do as part of the Perseverance team in just a sec, but um, where are you from? How did you get into uh, engineering? A little bit about yourself. So um, I grew up outside of Chicago in Lyle. Um, when I was a kid, I pretty much spent all of my time doing gymnastics and, and dance. Uh, Every day after high school, I did dance practice or a performance, um, but I always had a fascination with space. And uh, I always knew that I wanted to do something in STEM. And, um, you know, I would grow up going to the Adler Planetarium and would take field trips through school or go with my friends on the weekend sometimes. And 
I knew I wanted to go there and uh, go into that field and then learning more about um, engineering and how I got to work with teams and with other people to build something, to make something work. I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, so I decided on studying aerospace engineering and I went to um, the University of Colorado at Boulder where I got my undergraduate um, and my senior year of my uh, college, I uh, JPL sponsored our senior design project. And through there, I um, you know met some folks that worked at JPL and I asked them if they had any uh, positions available. And then I ended up interning at JPL. Um, and then eventually I found my way working on uh, the Opportunity Rover on the image processing and uh, product generation team. Opportunity. That, that is fantastic. Opportunity was my favorite of the two uh, of spirit and opportunity. So <laughs> that is, that's really great that you got to work on that team as well. Um, so you studied engineering. It sounds like uh, you, you took some initiative there in your senior year and you went, you know what, I'm just going to tell these people, you know what, I, if you have an opening, is that some advice you might give to a student who might be thinking, how in the world do I get a job like this? So any advice for kids out there before we get into what exactly you do for Perseverance? Definitely. Um, you know, if, if there's something that you want, you really got to just ask for it. And the worst that anyone could say is say no. And even then, though, you might keep you in mind for something in the future, but um, you got to let people know what you want and be your own advocate. That's awesome. So uh, talking about perseverance, which is why we're here today. So perseverance is landing in, in just a little bit. And um, what exactly do you do on the team? And uh, how does your engineering degree fit into all of that? Yeah, so um, on the team, I am on the image processing and product generation team. Same thing that I did for the Opportunity Rover, and I also did it for the Curios Curiosity Rover. Um, and our team is responsible for taking all the raw products, the raw data products that come down from the rover, and building them into images and um, building other downstream products out of those images. I'm gonna share really quick. So Stephanie's bringing up a screen share so she can show us something cool. All right, so what are we looking at here? So on um, the left side of the screen, you'll see a nav cam image from the Curiosity rover. Um, and this is only uh, one eye of the nav cam because we take all of our images in stereo. We have a left and a right eye. And uh, because they're in stereo, we're able to match pixels in each eye and figure out where that is in 3D space. And then from all of those pixels mapped in 3D space, we're able to build 3D terrain models, which is what's on the right side of the screen. Um, so those models are what the rover planners use to plan their drive activities and um, to plan the arm activities where they'll place different instruments on the surface. And that's kind of how we visualize what Mars looks like inside of our computer screen <laughs> while we're operating the rover. Um, so on the on the Curiosity rover, it was kind of cool. I got to work on three different teams. One of them was the team that commanded the engineering cameras. So we were actually the ones that took those images. Um, and then I was on you know, the image processing and product generation team. So we took those images, built them into the, the 3D terrain models. And then I was also on the uh, rover planner team. So I helped command the rover and planned the activities, figured out from science, where do we want to go? What target do we want to um, observe? What observations do we want to take and and plan that out and help make that happen? So I kind of got to do all three of those roles to a full a full circle. So when we're looking at these pictures, um, so we've got a, one of the nav camera navigation camera images on the left, and then making the terrain model on the right. How long would it take to go from say? you get your nav cam image on the left, 
to we're ready to actually move the rover to go inspect something and put a put an instrument down at something. How long would that take? Uh, so it de it definitely depends on the amount of data we might get down in a pass. Sometimes if we just get one image down, we're able to process it, build it into a mesh pretty quickly within a few minutes. Um, but then if we get a bigger pass, that's more data we need to process. Um, on the Curiosity rover, we also had uh, these were one megabit megapixel cameras where on uh, Perseverance, we're going to have 20 megapixel cameras that are color. Uh, so a lot, a lot more data to process with those. Um, but so same thing, it, it'll probably take a few minutes, uh, depending on we also we're changing how we're doing all of our, um, our software things are being done in the cloud now where they weren't before. So Probably a few minutes. <laughs> wow, that's really great. I, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you said oh, it could be a few minutes. People might expect, oh, it's a few days, <laughs> yeah. or, or a lot longer than that. It seems rather complicated, but it's, it's really amazing how quickly you can do all of that. Um, if you want to, uh, to put the view back on you, um, you can stop your screen share. There we go. And um, so. Uh, I, I know that landing day is probably going to be very tense <laughs> for the team, uh, but your job is going to pick up after the rover lands, really, and that's where you really start off with what you're going to be doing. What's a what's a typical Perseverance day going to be like, or I guess I should say a Perseverance sol? Um, what 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 would be a typical day for you? Like a typical work day, uh, assuming everything goes well, everything checks out, and you're ready to roll. Yeah, so um, I work on the downlink side of things. So we are in charge of getting all of the data and processing it. Um, and then there's another team that's working on the uplink side. So we get the data, build all the products that are needed for uplink planning, and then uplink takes those and, and uses them to plan the next SOL activity. Um, so a day for us is, First of all, get the data, make sure everything's coming in okay. Um, then build all of the products that are needed for planning the next day, like those 3D train models as an example. Um, and then we might get some requests from the rover planners uh, that they need some sort of special terrain model because the scene is um, really sandy and they're not able to get good correlation in the sand with with what they have. So uh, we'll be ready to, to help them build the products that they need to do the planning activities. Um, and, then, and then landing day, the, our biggest responsibility is to get those images down and get them out to the public right away and give everyone what they're looking for. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's, that's gonna be one thing everybody's gonna wanna ask right after landing, assuming everything goes well, that, okay, when we see a picture. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's really yeah. great. Um, so what is the, the nominal mission length? Uh, how, how long uh, are you gonna be doing this daily work? So for uh, the first three months, we're gonna be working on uh, Mars time. So our day is going to be shifting 40 minutes each day. We're gonna start, um, and then, yeah, every day we might we'll start a, bit, a little bit later. And so there will be some times when we're uh, working normal work hours and other times when we'll be up in the middle of the night. Um, and that's just to optimize uh, what the rover is able to do and the science we're able to get back from the rover. So just to make sure everyone really understands that. So today, let's pretend you might get up at eight o'clock in the morning on its uh, it, it might be morning in Mars time. And so tomorrow, in order to keep getting up at, in, the, in the morning on Mars time, you're going to have to get up at 840. And then the next day, you get up at 920 and so on. And so eventually, you're going to cycle through a whole series, a whole Earth day in order to keep on that Mars schedule. You're going to do that for three months. Yeah. That's, uh, did you do that with any if either of the prior missions? I did not. I started on Opportunity after um, it had been on the surface for 10 years. 
Uh, and then Curiosity had been on the surface for about three years when I started. So this will be my first time to do Mars time. I'm very excited and to experience landing day on the team. So this will all be new for me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, we wish you the absolute best of luck. And I know there's going to be literally millions of people around the world rooting for perseverance. And um, we can't wait to see the the images that you all produce. And uh, so just best of luck to the team. Anything, any last minute words, anything else you want to say to our audience before we end for today? Um, I think the only thing is, you know, when when I was in high school and even in college, I had no idea that I would end up working at JPL and NASA. I never really thought that that was something that I was capable of. Um, and all my coworkers, they have such a wide variety of backgrounds and everyone comes from different situations. It's, it's something that, you know, average people are doing. <laughs> And, and I love that you also mentioned that you were interested in dance and the arts and also engineering and science. And it just shows that, yeah, you can, you can do it all. It's, it's really great. So um, thank you so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Again, best of luck to the team. And uh, we look forward to seeing what Perseverance will do. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much to Stephanie Oy and the entire Mars public engagement team for uh, being able to talk to Stephanie and to Justin, if you saw his video earlier. Um, it was really great to talk to both of them and really experience this rover mission from the inside. So that was a lot of fun. All right, we have a few minutes. Do you want to answer some questions? I absolutely want to answer right. a few questions. Let's go to the question Let's go to the question. Yes. Amelia, who's a student, asked, when was Mars discovered? So. Mars is really interesting. Uh, it, it and several other planets in the sky, um, you can see with your own eyes. So basically, every time you look up and you see Mars, you are discovering Mars. And But the answer is, we don't know. Mars is visible to just your eyes. And so a uh, long, long time ago, people realized that, that some of these objects in the sky moved a little differently than the rest, and they called those objects planets. They didn't know what they were necessarily they just noticed they moved differently they were wandering stars right they were wandering stars yes. yeah exactly so uh, so we there's no way to ever know who discovered mercury and venus and mars and jupiter and saturn yeah i i like to look at those planets as part of our sort of shared heritage uh, of the sky you know there's no one person we've all known that these planets have existed since people have since they've ever been looking up yep. and and we're all under that same sky so when when we like to look up we know you like to look up as well so I, 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 there's a question here about uh, about how much of mars will the rover see i, I, I kind of like that question yeah, so go for it. this person's asking you know as the rover patrols the surface of mars and maps things what percentage of mars will be mapped by the end of this mars rover journey well this is a mission remember is to the surface uh, so what we're doing is we're looking if we have hoped that we have we're, 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 we hope we're going to be looking uh, at, at video from Mars very soon where it will be looking at this little tiny area on Mars. It's not what we call a survey mission. That's from orbit where we look at the entire planet. Remember we were showing the Mars globe earlier. It's based on uh, imagery from an orbiting spacecraft. This goes down to, to that one particular site and studies it in very fine detail. So in terms of the percent of Mars that it will cover, very, very small. I don't have a number for you, but it's... it's Tiny. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a <laughs> fraction of 1%. So it's just a, depends on what you want to do. Some missions look over large areas, but other missions look at small areas, but in really great detail. This is an example of the second one. Jesus has a great question. Can we bring the Mars globe up? Absolutely. Uh, that'll help with that question. His Good. Question is, how big is the volcano on Mars? And we think ah, yes. it probably means Olympus Mons. So here it is, right here. It. There it is. There so, oh, thank you, Mike, for zooming in. And here's Olympus Mons right here. So, to give you a sense of scale, you'll probably need to go grab another map, but that's cool because we love looking at maps. Olympus Mons has the same square mileage as about the state of Arizona. So, it has the diameter of the state of New Mexico. So if you take a look on a map and just look at the state of Arizona and say, compare that to Illinois, or, or if you're not in Illinois, in the state that you're from, um, or the country that you're from, wherever you are from, take a look at how, where you are compares to 
maybe the state of Arizona or New Mexico, and that gives you a sense of the size of the volcano on Mars. Now, there are a few others. So we've got three other major volcanoes on Mars. So uh, they are... Oh, you can point them out. They're over yeah, on the okay, side a little bit. There you go. So, so th there's Ascarius Mons r r right there. Pavonis Mons r r right there. And then I skipped one up to the north. Right, just, oh, down, it was further down. down. I'm doing this in reverse there order. Reverse. There you go. Right there. Oh, there's RC Mons. Mons. Yes. <laughs> so now I, I think I mentioned before that this whole area, if you zoom out a little bit, um, is called the Tharsis Plateau. These are called the Tharsis Volcanoes. And at one point on the history of Mars, this entire part of the planet became geologically active. And as I said before, so much so that when we carefully map the topography of this planet, or how th bumpy things are, or how things high or low, we know that this entire part of the planet kind of bulges out a bit. Now, we don't know all the details about the, the mechanisms behind that or how it works, but we can see that evidence of these giant volcanic features today on Mars. So one of the things that the rover is carrying is a microphone. Someone asked, how or will sound waves behave differently in a thinner atmosphere? Yeah, so the answer is yes. So Mars does have a, a, an atmosphere. It's, uh, it's very, very thin. It's around 1% the thickness of the atmosphere that we have here. And as I think we said before, no, there's no oxygen. Not a very nice place to visit uh, unless you have a, a spacesuit. But because the air is so thin, sounds should sound a, a lot different. Uh, uh, first of all, they won't be as loud. Right, it, less energy uh, is is getting to, to to you from those those sound waves, uh, so the rover is equipped with microphones. So uh, if something, if a, a an object or an event that would cause a loud banging noise here on Earth would make a quiet little banging noise on Mars, <laughs> it'd also be a different frequency because the atmosphere is is, is 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 a different density. That's one of the exciting things about including the uh, the microphone on on the on the spacecraft. That there are some science reasons behind it. But there's also just some really cool exploration things to, to to share, and it's it's about being able to for us to imagine that we're there on another world. So Kaylee asks, "What does Mars sound like?" We yeah, don't, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> that's right, Kaylee. Th that's why this is so exciting. We're, we're not. I mean, we, we mentioned one or two other things where we think that some of the instruments will make you know some noises and so forth. But honestly, stay tuned. You will find out with the rest of us. Okay, folks. So it is. We're looking at the clock about 19 minutes before we will get the signal, we hope, that the Perseverance rover has landed on Mars. So in about, uh, in less than 10 minutes, mm -hmm. it will actually land on Mars. But because of the distance between Earth and Mars, it will take a little over 11 minutes for that, for that radio signal to get from Mars to Earth. So we won't know till about 11 minutes later if it actually landed successfully. And actually, we need to be careful. There could be situations where if the information relay doesn't work as expected, we may not know right away if it actually landed. Um, so, and there is also, we also have to keep in mind, we don't know if it's actually going to land successfully. We will learn, to, we'll get two things out of this. It'll either be success or we will learn. That, that's the two things we will get out of this. Or it, both. Or, or both. both, exactly. <laughs> It'll, it'll successfully land, or if it doesn't, or if something happens, we will learn what it takes to potentially make the next mission to Mars that much better. Honestly, that, that's, that's part of the excitement. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you have to write a story that's very dramatic, like the question we we're just asking about that we don't know the, the answer yet. We honestly don't know what's going to happen over the next 20 minutes or so, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. why we're all excited to be joining you today to find out. Yeah, exactly. So... It's, um, it's been really exciting to get us to this point. Now, what is happening right now? It's called Entry, Descent, and Landing, E-D-L. And so NASA loves making acronyms out of things. So you get instruments on the rover that have all sorts of acronyms. But E-D-L is Entry, Descent, and Landing. And the last seven minutes or so of Entry, Descent, and Landing is that seven minutes of terror. So that means that the rover has encountered enough of the Martian atmosphere to start to slow it down. And then things will happen in sequence during that seven minutes. And so uh, we're going to follow along as we can with uh, what's going on with the feed from NASA to be able to see if entry, descent, and landing has resulted in success or future learning. So 
it's going to be exciting no matter what. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we've got all of these. Uh, we showed a, a video earlier of all the different things that need to happen dur during those several minutes. It's really a complex sequence of events that needs to happen. The spacecraft is going to be separating and then deploying its parachute and then firing its rocket uh, engines to, to, for, for a slow, hopefully uh, gentle descent. So as Michelle said, we're going to be tuning in to, to the feed from NASA to, to get the, the latest updates. Um, and we're only about, f I'm looking at the clock now, about five minutes away from actual landing time on Mars. Yep. And then we have to wait for another 11 minutes beyond that for that signal moving at the speed of light to get to us here on Earth. So what's happening right this very second? The heat shield on the rover should be uh, doing its thing. So it has a, it's a, basically a conical shaped spacecraft. And uh, Mike, can we, can we show the, uh, the uh, eyes on Mars? There we go. There we go. So this is a, a a feed from NASA. This is not a real uh, image or anything like that. It's a it's a computer simulation. Um, but this is showing uh, the, as the signals come to Earth what would be happening. And so if you take a look at the front part, so it's got the 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 back part of the spacecraft, the part that faces toward the sun to be able to get energy. In a little while, you're going to see that piece drop off, and it won't be needed anymore. And then the front part of the uh, spacecraft is the part that holds the rover. And one thing that we need to, to also point out that you're probably wondering how in the world did they fit that rover inside that conical shape? Um, so the rover is folded up, the mast is folded downward toward the, toward the deck. And so the rover is all tucked up with its wheels to be able to fit inside um, that, that spacecraft. And the heat shield is the curved part at the bottom. And that's the part that faces uh, angled toward the atmosphere to then dissipate the, the energy of this thing coming in over 10,000 miles an hour to then slow down to gently zero, <laughs> we hope, um, right after that. So anyway, so that's what's happening right now. So we're just going to keep an eye on that. So we're going to come back to us. And so Mike will do that in just a second. And so while he's doing that, um, so yeah, we've got about three minutes or so. So what's happening now is... Probably the parachute might be operating. Uh, possibly. Uh, one, I, I don't. I don't think quite because we're we're, we're still we're still ah. use, we're still using the heat shield to slow down. So That's that right. visualization that you just saw, you, you may have seen it had some color surrounding it. That was um as Michelle said, that's not a real picture, right? That was a, right. a computer generated illustration of what the spacecraft is is hopefully doing right now. Right? It's it's encountering the very upper reaches of the Mars atmosphere. Now we said before the Mars atmosphere is much thinner than the Earth atmosphere. But it is still uh, thick enough that as a spacecraft enters at thousands of miles an hour, it's going to generate a lot of heat due, due to friction. And that the spacecraft designers actually use that as a feature because you can slow the spacecraft down. In fact, there are some orbital missions. So there were some spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars uh, that in the past that actually use the upper reaches of the atmosphere. If you have an, an orbit that goes down low enough, it dips down into the upper ed edges of the atmosphere, and you can actually slow down, which so you can have, have uh, less of a rocket thrust, which enables you to build, get your spacecraft there e easier th than would be otherwise. So right now we're encountering the upper edges of the atmosphere there, slowing down, and then eventually we'll need a parachute. But even that's not enough, because the air is too thin, so we've got to use those rocket nozzles to finally slow down. Exactly. This spacecraft is huge, and so it takes a little more effort uh, to be able to slow it down. So. What we're seeing from the NASA feed is, uh, at least for the signals on Earth, atmospheric entry starts in about six minutes. Oh my goodness, I'm starting to get excited. <laughs> I'm starting to get nervous. That's right. It was it was kind of holding off up until now, but yes, I'm starting to get a little nervous. So um, so we're gonna we're gonna hang tight with you and uh, throughout all this process. So we're again we're gonna keep an eye on what's going on on NASA's side. You were talking earlier about how the thing uh, folds up. Since we have since we have a minute here, do you want yep. to talk a little bit about that? So j just if you look at the large representation of the rover behind us, if you're just joining us now, just as a recap, we're getting to Mars very soon. Yes. Hello from the Adler Planetarium. Hello. <laughs> uh, and then behind us is an amazing representation of the Perseverance rover. Uh, it, this represents what the rover would look like after it's been deployed and is driving around on Mars a bit. But it, right now, as Michelle was describing, it's tucked away in its, in its little uh, cocoon. That mast cam in the center there is folded down. And then the, the wheels aren't dropped down. They're sort of 
it kind of tucked up against its body, so to mm -hmm. speak. Is yep. that a good way to describe it's it? It's rover right. origami. Yes. yes. <laughs> and and then and then what, what will happen fairly soon is after that heat shield drops out, the wheels will drop down, and then the uh, the rover that you see there will be released on those cables from the sky crane, uh, and then it'll land gently, hopefully, on on the surface of Mars. All right. So five. About five more minutes, I think, before uh, we start entry, interfa entry interface. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to check and see if there are any more questions. Oh, I'm sure there are. Ooh, how fast is Perseverance going oh, through space? Good question. Yeah, it depends on when. <laughs> so it's going to start off at over, I believe, over 10,000 miles an hour yeah. um, at its fastest. And then it has to slow down to zero when that but when that parachute comes out so the heat shield will get it slowed down enough for the parachute to then come out but even that parachute is acting when the when the uh, rover is going at a supersonic speed hmm. so it has to be especially strong and but especially big to capture enough mars air to slow this thing down I see another question that I that I see uh, Geza has 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 addressed on, yeah. on the chat, but but I wanted to bring up here because because I I love this question. Uh, somebody's uh, asking. Matt was asking, uh, why do we study Mars more than other planets? Ooh, well, first question. of all, that's not always true. We do lots of science aimed at other planets, but it is fair to say that Mars does uh, capture our both our imagination culturally and also scientifically in a way that other planets don't. I think, and then I want to hear what, what, what you think mm -hmm, too, but mm -hmm. I think it's because Mars reminds us of home. That what, when you see some of these images from the surface of Mars, and if you imagine they're a grayscale, like a, like a black and white camera picture, and you compare it to some images you might uh, take, you know, in deserts uh, here on Earth, it sure does look similar. And we, then we know scientifically from the results of missions like these and, and earlier ones, that Mars was somewhat more Earth-like in its past. So I think that's why it really captures people's imaginations, both in, 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 in broader culture, but then also in the science world. What do you think? I would say from even from a scientifically practical standpoint, by the way, the rover's on Mars right now. <laughs> yeah. We're waiting for that signal to actually get here. So I just want to put that in context before I continue my answer. The <laughs> rover is on Mars right now. Now, hopefully it landed gently. Hopefully it landed gently. <laughs> anyway, so getting back to uh, the question, uh, practically, it's harder to get to planets interior um, to to the Earth. So getting to Mercury is actually surprisingly difficult. Um, getting to Venus, not quite so hard, but Venus is harsh. Venus spacecraft have landed from the Soviet, former Soviet Union on the surface of Venus, and the longest they lasted was about two hours because these, these spacecraft were basically melted and the, the, the temperature was so high that they didn't last very long. The, the air pressure is so great on the surface of Venus that it, it's, it melted and crushed these spacecraft. So portions of them are probably flowing across the surface of Mars as we, or of uh, Venus as we speak. So Venus is just harsh and difficult. I suspect we'll we'll send spacecraft there in the near-ish future, um, but Mars practically is easier than it is to to get to these others. So um, not to say they aren't as interesting, uh, but Mars Mars has some pluses going for it in that sense. And and besides that 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 it looks similar to 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 Earth, but it's also interesting that we can design rovers like this that do some if I can say, Earth-like things, right? As we said before, just a reminder, it's driving over the surface. It's going to drop off a little drone aircraft, kind of like you might play with uh, here on Earth. There's almost some, it, it's almost like we can imagine being there because the tools are somewhat similar, because it is a world that, its rotational period is pretty similar to uh, to uh, to Earth. A day is a little longer than, than Earth day, but, but somewhat similar. So that's why we're so excited to see what it looks up up close. And Andrew mentioned uh, a little bit longer than an Earth Day. Stephanie, if you saw her video a little earlier on the, on the rover team, um, she's going to be living on Mars time for three months. Three Earth months, she will be living on a day that lasts for 24 hours, 37 minutes long. And that, from we understand from the rover teams from the past that have had to do this, that absolutely messes with your with your uh, with your mind and, and be able to get your body regulated to all of that. It's difficult, but this is really important information for eventually when we send people. 
um, to be able to do that. So anyway, okay, we are checking out. Yeah, what, yeah, what, what, what were we just looking at there, Mike? Yep. Great. Is, so, oh, we've got data relay from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. That is fantastic. So that's good. So the, uh, the orbiters act as a data relay to Earth. And uh, I'm going to check the signals from the Deep Space Network now. And it looks like, I'm going to refresh here. Give me just a second. Now, now we're, what we're at right now is seeing, a, a, we're cutting back and forth. This is the NASA feed. So they're showing people at the Mission Control Center. So that so you see they're all lined up at their consoles there. So these are people all paying attention to the signals that are coming in from Mars. You might be wondering, are they doing important jobs? Are they pushing important buttons? Well, their job is mostly monitoring right now. As Michelle said, this thing is on Mars right now, one way or another. We're waiting for the signals to come back. So we are monitoring all those signals. Each of these people has a different sub uh, system that they're responsible for. And they're looking at the screens kind of like we are right now. This is, uh, by, by the way, we should say this is at NASA at Jet Propulsion Laboratory there in Pasadena, California. And you've been in that room too. Can yeah. You, it's, can it's, you it's, tell people it, behind the scenes about that room? It's kind of an exciting room to, to be in because they, as you might expect, they have big uh, 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 screens where uh, they have uh, readouts and you can see where the link is coming down in, in, in real time. Uh, and it's where they decide to do uh, uh, uplinks for, for the... Um, for, for different commands to the spacecraft. But as I said before, right now it's mainly, it's well, it is entirely a monitoring game. We're just seeing what's going on as we get closer and closer to Mars. It's banking in the atmosphere right now. So that means it is it is actively uh, changing its, its uh, orientation just slightly to be able to keep it at the right orientation. You do not want to come in too, too uh, steeply or else you're gonna crash. You don't want to come in too shallowly. You're going to skip off the atmosphere. So you want to be able to come in at the right angle, but depending on what the atmosphere is doing at the time, you need to be able to adjust for that slightly. By the way, the signals are currently coming in through uh, the, the radio dishes as part of the Deep Space Network in Madrid, Spain, ah. and Goldstone. Where's Goldstone? Located? Southern California in the Mojave Southern Desert. Southern California. Yep. So there we go. So we've got uh, in, uh, information coming back from the Deep Space Network now. So we've got these large radio dishes that are listening to those radio signals coming from Mars. And right. I'm starting to get really, 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 really nervous at this point. So go ahead. <laughs> hey, so far so good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you, you'll see sometimes we're going to, to, the, uh, to the NASA feed uh, there that where we, we show a representation of of what what the spacecraft is doing, but it takes into account the signal delay, if if that makes sense. So it's so that there so that you're seeing it there. Uh, so this happened a couple minutes ago, but the, but this is as as based on the signals as we're receiving it. So it's still in in its uh, in its cocoon, so to speak. And you've got uh, folks, yeah, they're just they're just sitting and watching. It's it's really kind of amazing. That's all they can do. But are there uh, are there Folks probably kind of nearby there. Yeah, actually, the actually, there was one clip. It, it was just a minute ago. Uh, maybe they'll come back to it. But there's sort of there are rooms off to the side where you can uh, you can see um, uh, where people are observing. The, the the folks that are sitting at the consoles right now are those engineers, like this person here, and the other folks that are responsible for those subsystems. And then the science team, of course, is is, is waiting with bated breath, just like we are, because these are people that have spent years of their careers uh, waiting for this thing to land. But uh, they are waiting just like the engineers are, just uh, monitoring all those uh, different signals as, as they come in. And look, see, 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 they have cameras just like we do here, uh, and, <laughs> observing uh, the team. There's information at the bottom of the screen there showing the altitude, the Mach, and the speed, uh, and acceleration as well. So this thing is slowly slowing, slowing down. And uh, oh, clapping is a good sign, usually. So <laughs> no, the parachute has deployed. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. There we go. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It's getting exciting. So this part, you probably could tell, we have not scripted this part of the show, and that is on purpose. <laughs> because, because we don't, really don't know the end really of the story. Okay, so, so again, to, to remind us, this is not an actual image, right? So this is a, the, this is a representation uh, made, uh, uh, you know, a realistic representation, but the parachute has been deployed, so, so it's now slowing down in the atmosphere. So the number you see in the lower part of the screen on the left where it says, 9.55, and uh, they, it's not getting updated every second, but that's that's the altitude in kilometers. So it's still a fair way uh, above the surface of Mars. And this uh, this was a, a parachute that's designed to operate at very high speeds, mm -hmm. right? 
And so it'll it'll help slow down the, the, the lander, but as we said before, it needs more than just this parachute. So it's gonna continue floating down. We're now at less than seven kilometers uh, and, and, and descending. And so is, is that Mach number, say, 0.2, right? Yep, 0.42 Mach. All right, great. So, oh, more clapping, that's good. So now, one, one of the other, you see they're clapping, and they're clapping because we have what's called radar lock on the ground. So the spacecraft has its own radar for detecting how far above the surface it is. So it's sending out these radar pings, and the radar signal is coming back. And this is how, again, it's all autonomous. It's, it's based on its next steps for what the altitude is. So it's measuring its altitude with its own internal radar. And it's also going to be able to use some of this information to potentially guide itself to a slightly safer location to land. So it's got its target location. Uh, oh my gosh, that is really cool. Now that is cool. So what the, what that graphic is, those 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 solid those straight lines, that shows the field of view of a camera. Now we're not going to get those images right now, but there's a camera that's actually. Uh, okay, so so I'll, I'll get back to that. But we soon we'll see some images, and then it it has found its landing site, and then what you see there, we've got the separation of the parachute, oh and we've got the rockets firing. Oh. So, oh so now what's happened is that, that sky crane bit with the with the rover part has separated from the what they call the back shell, right, where, which is attached to the uh, parachute, and that's floated away, so that that's gone, and you can see it's it's tilting, which is what it's supposed to do, so it finds its uh, its landing site. So these rockets are firing to further slow down. So we. Oh, Got wow. it. So what it's done, so uh, so it's now found it. It's figured out its terrain in around the landing site. So it's guiding itself. This thing, besides measuring its location, it it can tell how it's shifting and tilting. It also can it knows the terrain. Oh my God! And there goes the sky Holy crane. Cow. So the rover has separated, and you see down below. That's in meters, 20 meters above the surface. 60 feet. So the sky crane, so the rover has separated, and the rover's on the surface, altitude zero meters. Oh my God. Well, well, yes, that that's a representation. Let, let's get confirmation first. Oh my God. Did it? Did no, it? No, no. Can we, we clap yet? Can we clap yet? Gotta, yay! <laughs> oh my God. There we go. See now. <laughs> We know it landed so, because we're not paying attention to the uh, to, to the data stream. We're looking at the human reaction, and much oh the same. Oh my God! Oh, Michelle, let's give it. Let's give, oh, okay. let's give oh, it. My oh. oh my God! 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 Okay, so we saved this. We had this ready. Wait, 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 wait. So we had this ready. It's sparkling grape juice. We don't have alcohol here, but um, we have this ready. And we're going to share this with the team here. And I think I'm about to cry. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot fake the drama of this thing. Like, can, can I just can I just recap right now, uh, Michelle? Please. What just happened is that this thing successfully landed on another world, all these millions of miles away. And we, we watched it in real time along with you all all over the world. It doesn't get more much more exciting than that, right? Oh my gosh, Justin and Stephanie and Sarah at the Mars Engagement Team and everybody out there. We we, we don't know your names, but we, we can see some of the folks on screen. And um and oh my goodness. This oh I, oh I've got that I've got that oh, <laughs> feeling right see, now. See oh. even even the mission team is uh, is getting getting excited. Yep. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna open this. You up. gonna do it? Yep. D don't don't get uh, don't get Mike's uh, theater. Nope. Uh, nope. I have here. a towel. Great. I have a towel. So yeah. as so as we uh, and we're gonna do this later, but uh, uh, the next couple steps here, we gotta wait to hear more details from the surface of Mars. So over the next several minutes, we're gonna be paying attention. Uh, we don't know exactly when the first image we're going to get from, from the surface of Mars, from, from the spacecraft. Uh, it all depends on, as we said, we're just monitoring right now, right? So we may, it may be just a few minutes away, or it may take a little bit longer. Right, oh, so, so, so just getting that update that we've got an excellent, uh, s a strong signal from the rover on the surface of Mars. So the hard part is over right now. We just have to stay tuned for, for those images. So uh, we're going to be sharing those out. We'll stay tuned for another minute or two here. We may get some things. So the Hello, first image, the first image, uh, Mike, can you come out? Come on out. Come on out. We can, uh, we can spare you from behind the desk for a second. Um, <laughs> oh. What? Already? Yes. So, 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 so put, put, put down your beverages. 
Oh, wait, hang on. <laughs> so stay tuned. We'll, we'll see if they show it on the on the uh, on the feed here. Hold on. So 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 oh. there it is. So in the center of the so <laughs> so again, this is sort of a camera pitched uh, on on the, the mission control there. But the upper left there, you see that image, that sort of gray image. I know it's you can't see much detail, but that is a hugely important step that we have a first image from the rover on the surface of Mars. Wow. That's amazing. They said that it could take up to half an hour to get to get an image back. They'll get much better images. Um, now, Mike, you can come over and. Uh, and oh, there we go. There oh, we go. There it is. There so, it yeah, is. So, 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 sorry, but we, sorry, we keep. So, but, but this is too important to. So there, there, the, wow. the first image. The, it, it, I'm sure they'll get back to it, but uh, but it, I guess you can come back to us, Mike, because <laughs> there it is. Come on, Mike. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna uh, fade back and forth. There it is. You've earned this toast. So 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 we've got rocks on the surface of Mars. That is the, the and what you see there is the shadow of the Perseverance rover on the surface wow. of Mars, and there's the horizon. So that's one of those that's one of those hazard cameras on the on the front margin of of the of the rover that you saw in 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 the picture behind us there, right right behind oh, Jennifer right there. Oh my gosh. Um. So yes. So here you go. Oh everybody. So I hope wherever you are. You have a beverage of some sort. Grab some water. Grab grab whatever your favorite beverage is. To the Mars team, the Perseverance team all over the world, congratulations from the Adler Planetarium. We are so happy for you. And to our team here and our, our, our fellow staff who are at home, um, thank you, everybody. And uh, thanks for all your support out there for the past year while we've been closed. And uh, we hope to bring you many more programs in the future. And we hope that you will join us in person in the future, too. Please stay tuned for more from the surface of Mars, from here at the Adler Planetarium, and also from all over the solar system and, and, and the rest of the universe. We look forward to connecting you in the near-term future. Thank you so much for joining us today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>